morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas to all of you out there, man. Nothing but love for you. Um, just a second here, guys. For the first time, we're actually going live on Instagram while we're actually going live here like we normally do. So just bear with me here for just a second. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> So now I'm trying, I'm tr I'm doubling up on audio. I didn't realize that I would have, but let me, let me go ahead and shut down uh, Instagram. Otherwise it's going to ruin everything. There you go. So guys, man, number love for you guys. Thank you for joining us over here on Christmas Eve. Um, yeah, let me remove that here real quick. Yeah, there you go. So. Uh, real quick, man, I want to say what's up to Isaiah Feliciano, not my love, man. Also, man, uh, wishing you a wonderful Christmas. Only the Bully family, you got it. Miss Shea Tree, not my love. We got Furman Broom. Are you calling me, Kyle? No, okay, good. Um, we got Inserata, we got Hades, ECBK, not my love, man. Sally Adams, Larry Kohler. We got Samurai Kennels, man. Old Yeller Dogs. There you go, man. Maurice Humboldt, number love for you, bro. Teray Thompson. Guys, number love for you guys, man. Um, so definitely, guys, today we're going to be talking about inbreeding, line breeding, and outcross. And we're going to be hitting up on the COI or the COI or the coefficient of inbreeding, however you, you're you used to seeing it. Um, I will say this. Um last night our girl chanel uh decided to have puppies right and it was it was rather crazy man let, let me let me break it down to you guys so you can see how it goes by the way we got felipe hernandez rondon New pues claro que sí, cabrón. Pues claro que sí, cabrón. welcome on board every sunday at 10 a.m we're going live man we also got javier rivera he just gifted five QB and kennel memberships, man. Talking about the giving spirit. Can you go ahead and hit that one more time, Steve-O? Pues claro que sí, cabrón. Claro que sí, cabrón. Nothing but love, man. So, yeah, uh, last night, um, let, let me rewind. Yesterday, uh, my girl, Chanel, uh, throughout the whole day, she was acting normal. Uh, for those of you that don't have that much experience breeding or are new to breeding um there are signs when a female is starting to go into full-blown heat and one of the signs at least that i look for is when they start panting non-stop you know uh she this girl did not pant whatsoever man whatsoever here we are all day literally i walked them to the back of the property she was walking around with me everywhere uh you know pooping peeing eating drinking everything like everything was normal and six o'clock rolls around and i'm sitting in the living room and she's literally like right next to me her setup is like right next to me and out of the blue i i hear <laughs> and i was like oh man i already I mean, literally, when she started doing that, I already knew exactly what was what was happening. Why didn't I know this? Because her belly was so full and compact. Like when you touched her belly, there was nothing soft about it. You could tell that the puppies were packed up in there. And also, I had ran an x-ray on her uh, earlier in the week, and they had told me she would have anywhere between eight to nine pups, um, you know, and I, I just knew i just knew so anyways um she starts the panting so i call my vet uh she's like yeah bring her over um so i put her in the car uh my daughter thankfully she she came with me and i told my daughter i said i need you to come with me because i have a feeling if she's been quiet all day and she's been having you know contractions and whatnot she never led on to it i have a feeling that she could start dropping puppies in the car and I need somebody in the back with her while I'm driving. So I get in the car, man, and I start driving. As soon as I start driving, it starts pouring. And man, here I am going, you know, 80 on a 55 because I need to get, you know, my, my vet is about two hours out. So she pops out the first puppy, man. Biggest puppy. I would say it would contend between 
it would be one of the top three biggest puppies we've ever uh, we've ever had at birthing since we've been breeding. I mean, I it was it was a thing like this, man. I mean, it was just massive. But it was born dead. You know, my daughter, she, she worked on the puppy for like a good 15 minutes. There was just no way to revive. We were hitting them, you know, straight between uh, the, the lips and the nose uh, with a little needle to see if he would activate. The tongue was pink, but the paws were pale, which tells me he was obviously under distress. Whenever a puppy is under distress, when they're making it out of the canal, what ends up happening is the placenta is on the uterus as the puppy is making it through the canal the placenta starts coming off of the uterus that's important because that's the only way the puppy is able to breathe while that placenta is getting that oxygen rich blood through the uterus so once it once that placenta comes off the uterus you literally got about 12 minutes to have that puppy out if not sooner and what ends up happening is when the puppy starts going into distress because the oxygen levels come down, what happens is the, the puppy's body automatically starts shunting blood from the extremities to the vital organs, brain, heart, kidneys, liver, right? So that's probably what was happening to that pup. But unfortunately, you know, he was born and he didn't make it. Um, and literally within a minute, we had another puppy come out. This, this this next puppy was alive. And then within another two or three minutes, we had another puppy come out. And within another two or three minutes, another puppy came out. I was like, dang, it seems like we're gonna make it to the vet. By the time we get there, all the puppies are gonna be out. So we finally made it to the vet. And, um, you know, they, they took her in and, uh, you know, doc like always she preps her up when not whenever she's ready she called she called me and my daughter in we go in there and she starts pulling pup after pup after pup after pup after pup i'm like i was like man how many puppies are in there she's like i don't know I, you know she keeps pulling out so long story short chanel had a total of 11 puppies 11 puppies i'm counting the dead one right once you take the dead one out the stillborn one we had a total of 10 puppies we had five males and five females and immediately after she you know she came from the recovery room this this is what it looked like Beautiful puppies, man. Let me tell you, beautiful, healthy, a lot of vitality. Um, I mean, it, it was amazing. The entire night I've been, my wife and I, we've been next to her. Uh, puppies are like just moving around, man. Like they, they are ready to be alive. And it's a welcoming sight. If you're a breeder, it, it is a welcoming sight. Thank you guys. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, guys, listen, I, I'm going to tell you right now, Emilio Garcia, and I appreciate you, brother. But puppies passing away at birth i'm not saying it's normal and i'm not saying to accept it and i'm not saying anything all i'm saying is it comes with the territory if you're a breeder it comes with the territory you're going to have females that are going to go into full-blown uh labor uh when you least expecting it or it was raining or there was a who knows or there was an accident on the road or something i couldn't have made it in time it just things like that do happen and can happen so, I mean, you never get used to it. I never do. The death of a puppy for me is probably the worst thing that a breeder goes through. But the bottom line is, if you do this long enough, uh, whether you like it or not, you're, you're going to go through it. You're going to go through it and you have to be prepared, not just uh, prepared that it's going to happen. Once it does happen, it's going to take an emotional toll on you. I don't care how long you've been doing this. So um let me get to our topic today guys and that's inbreeding line breeding outcross and the coi right coi and that's nothing more than coefficient of inbreeding and what that means is how inbred is your dog how inbred is your dog uh how many times uh does that dog have 
you know, either a parent or even a grandparent or even a great grandparent, whatever, uh, within his lineage. In particular, I always look at the first three generations because I feel that in those three generations, that's where that dog's inbreeding is going to be most powerful. But make no mistake about it. If you inbreed enough, you could go four or five generations uh, where, you know, that dog's effects is still there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know what it looks like. Uh, let me show you guys uh, what what I'm talking about and what it looks like uh, through an Embark test. By the way, for those of you that don't know, Embark is a genetic testing site. And all of these puppies you just seen we dropped, they're all going to get genetically tested because our girl Chanel, let me bring her up over here. Let me see where you're at, Chanel. Here she is. Our girl Chanel over here. She is uh, a, a cryptic Merle or a phantom Merle. In other words, she carries the Merle gene, which is a dominant gene, but she's not Merle. You can't see it anywhere in her body. And I feel that also her coloration plays a big part of it. But if you look down here where it says COI, coefficient of inbreeding, it says 10%, right? Um, let me show you the puppy's dad. So we could see what his koi is, and that's our boy 305. His koi is 11. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, neither dog should be able to dominate this breeding. But let's go ahead and click on that 10%, and let's see exactly what Embark has to say about the koi. And what it says is, learn how inbreeding and immunological diversity could affect your dog's health and longevity coefficient of inbreeding cuban k chanel is 10 percent, right so let's go ahead and click on that here real quick let me just show you genetic diversity so chanel um is over here at the 10 percent mark right and if you notice all pure breeds this black line represents all pure breeds which means they have less genetic diversity than our american bully our breed the american bully which the american bully as you can see has a lot more genetic diversity what does that mean that means that we all know the american bully is a composite breed uh some are willing to admit that you know bulldogs were brought in others are willing to admit that mastiffs were but whatever the case may be, um, you don't get the American bully we have today from just breeding a pit bull and a Staffordshire Terrier. I understand that's where it started, but that's not where we're at, if, if that makes any sense. And I feel that that brings more diversity to the blood. And that's what you're seeing here uh, with the koi. Okay. Now, this over here this is where the nuts and bolts is at because here you have all 36 chrome uh i'm sorry all 38 chromosomes if you notice they're all numbered and everywhere you see the yellow is where inbreeding or where more homozygotic genes homozygotic meaning identical genes are popping up okay once we're able to figure out what each position of these uh chromosomes or I'm sorry, where, where the position of these um, high homozygotic pairs are within each chromosome, then you can pretty much tell what's going to happen when the puppies are born or, or get a good idea before it actually even does happen. Okay, uh, so that's where that's where the koi comes in, the coefficient of inbreeding, guys. All right. Um, let me see if there's anything else I could give you off of this page. Now, obviously, this is just showing you that um, our dogs are of high diversity. You got 60% of dogs are high diversity. And then it shows you low diversity dogs. Now, low diversity means dogs that are inbred um, or even line bred. What's going to happen is you're going to have a higher number of koi. Remember, I said the coefficient of breeding of inbreeding for our girl Chanel is 10%. And the lines in blue are for the American bully. So there's 
what that what that translates to is that there's a lot of diversity okay within our breed okay but if you were to go to say a dog like the pug or even the bulldog uh, you're probably going to notice that this black line may be even lower because their level of of inbreeding brings the koi higher and reduces the diversity so it's not uncommon say for an english uh, for an english bulldog for example to have a koi of 42 right but a koi for 40 of uh, 42 for the american bully would just be ridiculously high and you can tell because here on this bar 42 would be somewhere over here and you could see that american bullies are not that inbred okay we're more on the diversified side whereas for a bulldog since it's such an older breed and it has been line bred over and over and over again and possibly inbred over and over again you're going to get higher koi numbers when you have a higher koi number it makes the dog's genetic traits that much more powerful okay especially when they're going into a dog that has a lower koi how do you get a lower koi you get a lower koi when there's more diversity so i said in this show we're going to talk about inbreeding which we just spoke about which is going to lower diversity and increase the koi right pushing forward uh in in, in the strongest of way its traits next up is line breeding now line breeding is a little bit different than inbreeding let me go back to the definition of inbreeding because i know i didn't hit up on that i want to make sure you understand that inbreeding in the dog world is breeding son to mother father to daughter that close of a relationship also i want to make a point under no circumstance circumstance do you ever breed a full bred brother to a full bred sister meaning two puppies from the same litter or they could be from different litters but have the same parents in common you you never want to breed that together because that's where you can have issues from temperamental issues to uh, pathological issues all of a sudden your dog's all come out with a kink tail or they all come out with a heart murmur or they all come out blind or, or or with eyesight issues or things of that nature okay so the probability of the genes morphing is somewhere around 30 percent mark whenever you have two dogs from the same litter breeding to each other however that percentage goes down somewhat when it's a son to mother breeding or a daughter to father breeding. Now, I wouldn't recommend for anyone to be doing inbreedings unless you know exactly what you're doing. And I don't mean that you started breeding six months ago and now you feel like you know exactly what you're doing because that's not the way this works. You need to know about genetics before you do any type of inbreeding because you could actually do more harm to both your program to to the actual breed and and to everything if you're inbreeding two dogs that have for example the same pathology and pathology is nothing more than the same disease or genetic propensity of disease so if you have two dogs say for example that have some sort of heart issue and you breed them together well what do you, what do you think you're going to get you're going to get puppies with heart issues that's what you're going to get right so make sure that you know what you're doing on the genetic side before you decide to go that route um does inbreeding play a role in breeding and i want to say yes okay but it isn't it doesn't play the common role that we see today today inbreeding is 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 a common practice and in reality uh, if you go back to the older breeders of other breeds, such as even the Rottweiler or the German Shepherd or, or even the Pitbull for that matter, uh, inbreeding usually would happen maybe once in six generations. Whereas today, you got all these marketers 
uh, that want to sell you uh, Gucci and BMW and all these brands. And they look at bloodlines like brands. And, you know, they'll, they'll post on there. Well, you know, we got this dog that's from XYZ and Gucci and, and Bugatti and this and that. And what you're not realizing, especially when you're new, is that all this inbreeding is not a good thing. It's actually a bad thing, right? Um, so just want to make sure you understand the definition of inbreeding. Now, line breeding is similar to inbreeding but it's spaced out further so rather than it being fa uh, father to daughter or mother to son it could be auntie to nephew it could be cousins uh some people consider a half brother half sister breeding as a line breeding what you're going to notice in those scenarios is that the koi will actually go up okay um, the koi will actually go up. I'm sorry, guys. I thought I was showing the screen. I just realized it. You're going to notice that the koi is going to go up, but it's not going to go up as high as you would when you inbreed. So let me give you an, ex an example. If you was to inbreed, you more likely than not are, say you had two dogs that had a koi of 20 and you inbred them, right? More likely than not, you're going to be somewhere between the 30 and 40 percent koi for those pups more likely than not you may have one that's at 27 so don't shoot me for that and you know but more likely than not you're going to be anywhere between 30 and 40. and that's a pretty high koi especially for this particular breed okay um but when you line breed so you're breeding aunties to nephews and cousins and half brother, half sister. If you were to breed, say, two of them that had a koi of 20, you are probably going to end up with a litter of pups that are going to be having koi's anywhere between 20 to 30. One or two may go over 30. So if you notice, you're still increasing the koi, but it's not going to be as dramatic as when you inbreed, right? especially if you do like grandfather to granddaughter uh there you're going to get a lighter koi you're probably going to get anywhere between uh the low 20s to the mid 20s if if both of them are at 20 uh with the koi um so i just i hope you're able to understand the differences uh between outcross line breed and inbreed and there is a space and room for each one so let's say you have a dog whose koi is 35 right and you have another you have a female for him whose koi is a five right what it means is she has nothing but pure diversity and him at 35 he his blood is really tight he doesn't have that much diversity he's got a lot of traits that are are going to be are going to be pushed forward and if he if he at a 35 goes into that female that's at a five 99 of the time he's pushing forward his traits right that's what that means i've had a lot of you write to me and ask me um why is it that um is, is it bad to have a dog that has a low koi and my answer is whether your koi is high or your koi is low it's not bad. All it means is you have this puzzle piece with high koi, or you have this puzzle piece with low koi, and it depends how you set up, how you put things together. That's going to determine the result you're going to get. So if you have a dog with a high koi and you want to pass his traits on, then you want to find a female with low koi so that she just serves pretty much as a place holder, or, uh, holder and he could just push his traits on through to the next generation. Whereas if he's at 35 and you have a female that's at 30 and you breed him, he, he more than likely, he's not going to dominate that litter the way he would if she was at a five. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Let me, let me go. Uh, let me go to the questions. Um, real quick here. Let me go to questions. Uh, there you go. What's up, Detailer Number Love? Larry Kohler says, yes, this was a bad week, bro. My girl had her C-section on Monday and things went great. She had nine pups. We got home. I put the babies on her and she was doing great. But through the night, we went. 
Ooh. Yeah, man, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, uh, D- Dietrich Hagen says, congrats on the new leader, Chief. Merry Christmas. But least now we got to you and yours. Thank you, man. Number love. Larry Kohler says nine to two. So he went from nine puppies to two puppies. Guys, the first 72 hours that you have pups, it's, I'm going to tell you, man, it's breeder intensive. I don't care what anybody tells you. You know, you know, breeders, we, we, we all want to make this look easy. We all want to market. We want you to buy our puppies. So we feel that if we make it easy, you're going to want to get it from us because we make it easy while the other guy is making it difficult. I'm going to tell you right now, bro, those first 72 hours, I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been breeding. You better be on top of those pups. You better be on top of those pups. Right now, we got 10 puppies, all right? What we've done is, since we have five males and five females, is we've grouped the females together and the males together. And we got them on full rotation. So we'll grab the females, put them on the breast, let them eat until they fall asleep. And as soon as they do, we're removing them and we're bringing in the boys. Okay? This is just for the first 72 hours, guys. It's a lot of work. Don't get me wrong, because it's every two hours. But this is how you're able to improve the odds. Because if you just dump all 10 puppies there and you let mom do whatever, what's going to end up happening is there may be 10 teats there for the puppies to go suck on. The problem you got is the weaker or the smaller pups are going to get pushed to the back and they may not eat. What ends up happening a lot of times is by the third day, you start noticing there's a feeble pup and he or she starts crying, right? Whining. And usually whining puppies are puppies that need a lot of attention fast because a puppy will fade on you within hours, within hours, right? So it's really important those first 72 hours, guys. And Saratha, I just embarked my latest uh, litter. And two pups that show no visible sign are ghost try. There you go. This is why you do it in Sarata. This is what separates the backyard breeder from, from the real breeder right here. If you have access to Embark, right? This is what you want to do. And this is why she has two puppies that are ghost try. She would have never known, right? Unless she embarked and she can tell that they are tries to begin with. And, and, and specifically, if you're dealing with Merles, uh, Koi were 10 to 14%, but they added mass cell, even though both parents embarked here, so pups otherwise clear. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, this mass cell thing, and I've spoken to Embark till I've been blue in the face. It's just something new. It's a new marker. They're able to identify with their equipment now, and 99.9% of the bullies are going to come out with MCT. Okay, mass cell tumor. And when you read it, oh my God, mass cell tumor. I don't want to buy a puppy that's going to die from cancer. Chill out. This is just them showing that there's a marker that's identifying. Okay, it's almost like CRD4. CRD4, for example, for the longest time was showing up as a marker and people didn't want CRD4, of course. But with time, we found out CRD4 doesn't affect our breed whatsoever. Um, I'm not saying mass cell will not affect us. I'm saying that now their new equipment is showing it on all the puppies that are that have American Bully or that are American Bully, I'm sorry. And um, it's going to be time before we, we, t- we can tell whether this is like CRD4 or if it's something we should take seriously. Either way, you should take it seriously. Just so you know, mass cell usually does not pop up until the dog is around six years, six, seven years old. And typically if it's caught early, it's a simple operation and it's the end of that. I'm just giving you a heads up guys. Uh, Brandon Kai says, uh, so if Koi's low, half brother, half sister would be okay if there's no health issues. Brandon, I would I would agree with that statement. I would agree with that statement. Uh, Steven Torres, when is high genetic diversity good for your program? It is good when you've tightened your program. Years ago, I met a breeder and he was, he was knowledgeable, he was knowledgeable, but he got into the habit right now. This is where, where subjectivity to the breeder comes in. He got into the habit into inbreeding everything in his yard. Everything was inbred. And what ended up happening was once everything was inbred, he bottlenecked himself 
bottlenecked himself completely because now you must outcross. There's there's no way in hell if you have dogs in your yard that are at 35 koi that that I would recommend for you to go, oh yeah, 35 with another 30, 30 koi. Go ahead and in, inbreed that. No, there's no way. There's no way. Uh, what I would recommend at that point is you must outcross. Get that fresh blood in. And what I mean by that is go from the homozygotic pairs to heterozygotic pairs, meaning pairs that are not the same, because that's actually going to give you diversity and it's going to give your dogs better health, better immunity, better, better, everything, better, better, everything, guys. Sally Adams says, Larry Culver, I'm so sorry. It's really tough. My heart's with you. Prayers for all of you. Keep the faith. Absolutely. I say, Feliciana, holy fam you spit knowledge for the for the free too y'all better like comment subscribe not a single youtube teaching like this man salute to you fam don't love man and guys we i do this because i love breeding i love what we do um breeding is right up my alley it's talking about genetics and and and, and things of that nature nothing is a hundred percent certain in genetics which that's where the challenge comes in and and, and you know i love it and i like i like sharing it with you guys uh larry Comer says yeah yeah it is sad man al says that's true my female did good with, with 11 by herself she was a real good mom yep any thoughts on NCL4A hasn't seemed to affect my male uh, that's 11 years old. Again, guys, these markers are going to pop up. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to affect our breed. And one good advantage that our breed has over these other breeds is that very diversity I showed you. Because here's what happens, guys. When you have diversity, when you have that the, the blue bars that are so far higher than that black line, what ends up happening is um, the poly chains, the genetic poly chains. So let, let me let me tell you. So you have these chains that could be thousands long, thousand characters long, right? What ends up happening is when you started our breed, we started with Pitt and Staffordshire Terriers. So whatever their poly chains were, because they're very similar, uh, they might have retained those long poly chains. With time, breeders started introducing other breeds. Amongst them, for example, is the Bulldog. So once you bring the Bulldog in, that genetic poly chain that's a thousand characters long now gets chopped somewhere because the Bulldog is not a Terrier. Right, might have started out as that, but it's no longer a terrier at this point. He breaks that genetic poly chain. So, if you needed that thousand long poly chain for these, like for example, the NCL4A to actually affect a dog, well, once you bred it with a bulldog, you just broke that poly chain. So, now I don't know if the dog's a carrier, if it's not, or if it doesn't affect us in any way. But the more breeds you bring in and the more diversity you have, the more these poly chains get broken up. Now, they don't have all the requirements they need to be able to show the pathology or the disease. Um, yep. Big big beach bullies, cool eye in the house. Uh, wait a minute. Let me bring in Kyle. What you got, Kyle? Oh, I was just showing you your time. Oh. No problem, man. Got you. Big Beach Bully says, uh, my girl is pregnant now. Her first litter, she spit out 14, but only one survived. <sighs> Wish me better luck this time. I'm also more prepared. Absolutely. Also, some people have a, a little bit of a misunderstanding. And what I mean by that is they feel that the larger the breed, the better, right? Because they're thinking dollar bills in their head. Um, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest with you guys. Um, if you told me before, before Chanel had her pups, if you told me, um, Raul, we're going to give you four males and four females, would you take that? And my answer would have been yes. In fact, I prefer no more than eight puppies in a litter. I know, I know there's people watching me right now saying, oh no, I wish I had 32 pups in a litter. Yeah, no, you don't. You don't trust me. You don't. Uh, I feel like eight pups in a litter is enough for the female to be able to handle things. That doesn't mean that the first 72 hours I'm not going to be on top of her. But six to eight puppies, the female should be able to handle everything. And she should be able to have enough milk. And you shouldn't have any puppies 
you know, struggling to feed and that sort of thing, right? Uh, once you have 12, 14 pups, you don't have enough breasts or teats to be able to feed 14 pups. So now you got to go into rotation, right? You got to rotate the pups and you got to start figuring out how to do it because the, especially the smaller pups, if they can't get in and feed, those are usually the first ones that are going to fade, right? Um, that's just basic, basic knowledge, uh, if you will, for breeders. Um, the other thing I want to, I do want to tell you guys is that, um, I've had a lot of you writing to me asking me, you know, when do you give, uh, your multivitamin to your puppies, by the way, if you don't know new vet, my multivitamin and new joint plus our joint support are the only two multivitamins and joint support that we use on this platform. And we've been giving it to mom ever since before she got pregnant, we're giving it to her while she's pregnant and one. Once the puppies come off of mom on day 24 and we put them on mush, guess what? They're going to be getting it at the same time. And so Kyle was telling me before we came on, he said, Raul, you need to make sure to show this video. So let's show it. Oh, look, the new vet just came in. Finally. Man, I've been waiting on this all month. Oh. It gets two for my body weight. Mm. It does taste like chicken. <clears throat> oh yeah. Makes me feel a lot better now. All right, time to bring them to the dogs. Also, let me bring Kyle on here. Kyle, ever since you've been taking NuVet, have you noticed anything different aside from your feet straightening out and, and your joints working better? Oh, yeah. Plenty of things. My back doesn't hurt as much. And the blue bottle, I don't even want to get started on the blue bottle. All right, man. Well, good deal, man. I'm glad you were able to share that with us. Also, while we're at it, let me show you guys this. Hmm. Hill science. It's veterinary approved. What did Raul say about hill science? God? No, it's Raul from the queue. And obviously you didn't watch my dog food review video. You would have known that that is the one food I would never recommend. I went ahead and left you a link in the description, so check it out. I'm just gonna walk away. Walk away. Walk away. <laughs> Well, let me tell you guys, man, if you like uh, Kyle's videos that, that we make here, uh, give us a like, give us a share, drop a comment, and we'll definitely uh, play a lot more of them. Uh, we have Sarah Gutierrez saying, Raul, have you personally ever had a situation of one of your moms ever consuming her pups? When you say consuming, Sarah, uh, are you saying mom eats it, like orally takes the dog in and swallows it? Or are you referring to the puppy in vitro being consumed? So I'm going to refer to both. That way I'll, I'll answer both. So first and foremost, uh, you've been following me, um, not this past summer, but the summer before. We actually got four females pregnant. Okay, pregnant. We did ultrasounds on them on day 31. They, they all had puppies. By day 40 none of the four had the pups they consumed the pups in internally their body whether it was through stress whether it was the heat whether whatever it was decided to go ahead and consume the, pup, the 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 pups already in vitro and dogs have the ability to do that if the circumstances are not right or there's stressors uh that 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 just makes the female change the chemistry of her brain because it, it, it all has to do with the brain, guys. This is why it's important that if you have a pregnant female, you make sure she can get enough sunlight. She's able to see sunlight. Don't just have her in your house. I've had so many people write to me about, oh, my female won't get pregnant. Uh, maybe she's gotten pregnant, but you know what? You always got her inside of your house with the AC on. And what ends up happening is she's not going outside to get en enough sunlight. Sunlight, believe it or not, allows serotonin to be released in the brain you know dogs need this right when 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 you don't have that 
that amount of serotonin that's needed, it may be a, sud a shutoff switch for the dog to consume the pups because obviously there's something wrong. The dog may be thinking it's full blown winter, at least her body is, because chemically everything goes through the pineal gland and then gets released to the rest of the body. And this is how, uh, if the dog is under stress, if the dog is too cold, if it's too hot, if it's not getting enough sunlight, whatever, this is how the dog's body internally, right? The dog doesn't even know it's happening. Internally will actually have her reconsume her pups. Um, let me see here. Okay, she, Sarah, you say yes, but I'm going to ask her both questions. The other one is, have I had a dog actually eat a puppy? It's funny. We had a conversation, my vet and I, last night about this very thing because she was telling me that she had she breeds dogs herself and she was telling me that um she actually had a dog that ate two live puppies right two live puppies these weren't puppies that were dead so let, let me let me make a distinction as to why there's a distinction between dead puppies and live puppies right so in the wild the gray wolf the only ones that mate is going to be the alpha male and the alpha female all the other beta females become surrogate mothers what do i mean by this they go into a false pregnancy right you might have seen this with your very dog if you have another female that went that that got pregnant and you may have one that went into false pregnancy and they'll have milk and everything this is just nature's way of assuring that the pack is going to survive. So if something happens to that alpha female, the surrogate mothers step right in. If nothing happens to that alpha female, that's fine. But now the puppies have an endless supply of milk because it's not just mom. They have these four or five surrogate mothers around them that also have milk, right? So what ends up happening in nature is if a puppy dies in the den because wolves are den animals, if the puppy dies, what ends up happening is if the mother does nothing with that pup, that pup will decompose. That smell is going to attract bears, other gray wolves, uh, other predators, right? Also, it's going to contaminate the rest of the other pups. So it's not unheard of that when the mother wolf sees that her pup dies that she consumes it she eats it okay and she's eating it for all the right reasons right that's a dead pup right when, when i was talking to my vet she was saying that the pups were alive and well and mom went after them and ate them and obviously there's something terribly wrong there Okay. And some of the things that I can, I can see going on with a situation like that would be number one, if mom is in pain. So if mom got a C-section and she didn't get a pain shot from the vet and you're not giving her something for, for pain, like for example, in our case, we, we give our dogs uh carprofen. Um, if you're not giving something for pain, then the mother may lash out at the puppies out of just severe pain, right? They, dogs you have to understand they de they may deal with pain they deal with pain totally different than us some of them may go overboard others may just be able to hold down hold it down so if you have one that's going overboard it wouldn't surprise me that a dog with pain would do something like this okay keep in mind that also a dog in pain in general now let's take the female they just had pups out of it it could be a male you have a male that's in pain whatever that may be it could be an infection in one of his molars it could be uh he hurt he hurt his back limbs whatever if he is in severe pain he may lash out at his very owner that he adores and he's just not within himself anymore is what i'm trying to say uh so yeah um as far as a female here in my prop you know here, here in my camp eating a pup it has never happened okay uh but i make sure like i did last night that she got a pain shot before we left uh we have carprofen on board we're giving carprofen every 12 hours not only that she is being monitored um at all times and you know we're moving the pups right so we got 10 puppies right now i told you for the first 72 hours 
we're putting the females and the males grouped together and the males are feeding and once they're done they fall asleep we move them out the way we bring the females on there right we're not just throwing 10 puppies at mom without a pain shot at the vet and with no pain medication here at home especially those first 72 hours because you're asking for it you're asking for for things crazy things like that uh to happen uh let me see all right we got deron the realtor number love man all right man appreciate you man thank you uh alex says good morning bully world happy holidays to everyone enjoying the weekend you got it man my females are product line breeding did you recommend keep that route she's very good in everything structure temperament and health no issues at all koi's 20 percent uh thanks for all that knowledge sulema let me tell you this i personally feel that you can still line breed her at 20 percent uh but i wouldn't i wouldn't line breed her if the dog I'm line breeding her to has inbreeding in his background. So for example, say you're going to breed her at 20% with her uncle, who's at 30%. I wouldn't do that. And the reason I wouldn't do that is because 27 to me, right? And again, each breeder has their own threshold and their own ideas and subjectivities. To me, 27% koi for our breed from 27 up is I consider it high. I consider it at that point, uh, we're not going to, at least in my camp, we're not going to inbreed and we will selectively line breed. So the line, the borderline that I don't like to go over would be 27. Now, don't get me wrong. The day may come that we decide to make an inbreed, do an inbreeding, and we may have a dog running around here with a 36 koi. Make no mistake about it. I did that on purpose and there's a reason for it, right? But what you're asking for, um, if you have, say, an uncle that's 22, 18 to 22, I, I, I will still go ahead and line breed. That wouldn't be an issue, in my opinion. But keep in mind, if you line breed two generations in a row, more likely than not, that third generation, you're probably going to have to outcross and let that blood breathe a little bit. Let, let those homozygotic pairs start becoming a little bit heterozygotic. It's not the end of the world. In fact, uh, some of the best dogs you're ever going to find, you're going to you're going to see that one of the two parents was inbred and they actually outcrossed and that blood is able to blossom and, and flourish. All right. All right. So, Mike, we got Mr. We got Mr. Mizike Higginson saying, are there any other health traits that are not a threat unless they're on both sides that people need to be made aware of? So, Mike, here's the thing whether it's embark or wisdom panel or uh what is it cal state fullerton whatever um you got to understand where science is right now when it comes to uh dog genetics right so we have the entire genome now that we were able to identify everything now what we're trying to piece together is within each particular gene right where is it fall where is that allele falling right uh on the locus i'm sorry where where the location is falling and what does that immediately translate to the dog so what i'm trying to say is this they are learning and they're bringing in markers right now like that mct but as a community we're probably gonna have to go another five years kind of like how we've done with crd4 with MCT in order to know if MCT actually affects our breed or not. We're not going to know. You got to give it time. You got to give it time. And yes, there's going to be people out there. Um, and more than likely, I can't even blame them that are going to breed two dogs that are MCT positive. And what's going to happen is five years are going to go by. The dogs are ready, you know, just born or whatever. And five, six, seven years, you're going to find out that MCT doesn't affect our breed. And you have dogs that have been bred MCT to MCT, and it doesn't affect our breed. Just the same way we did with CRD4. So I would love to be able to tell you, hey, Mike, MCT, don't worry about it. Bottom line is, right now, even Embark doesn't know. Because I've had the conversations with them. They're like, we're just identifying the marker. We don't know if it affects your breed. The advantage our breed has, which I mentioned earlier, is that we are a composite breed. So we have many breeds that make our breed today, right? 
And when you bring, say, Bulldog, right, into into a line that was just straight up Pitbull and Staffordshire Terrier, what that Bulldog is going to do is he's going to chop that genetic poly chain in half and three parts and four parts, who knows? But once that gets chopped, more likely than not, that pathology that's affecting terriers is no longer going to affect our breed. This is why diversity is so important because when you bring diversity, you're able to chop these pathologies or disease processes in the genetic polychain. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the best way I can explain it. Ah, oh, Sally Adams, she loves pressure and I do too. Um, we got Aon saying, my female came from a Merle family. She tick and white with splash of Merle on her ear, but her pups are brindles. How did that happen? I don't know. Did you embark the whole litter? Because you're, you're assuming that they're all brindles. What if they're brindles and they're also, I don't know, uh, cryptic Merles. We don't know. Right. And you're not going to know until you embark the entire litter. So that's, that's the best answer I can give you. Um, Mickey Lucero says, how do you get your vet to give you pain meds after she had a C-section? Her first breeding, she didn't get meds and I could tell she was uncomfortable. Uh, Mickey, this is where, you know, your relationship with your vet has to be of the utmost importance. If you're breeding, your vet, whether you like it or not, plays a vital role in your yard. Um, because if they're not there when you need them or in your case, they're not giving you pain medications. To me, that's a, a gross oversight. If a dog just had a C-section and you're not giving her pain medications and you're the vet, like, I don't know. I really would love to hear uh, your thought process, your logic as to why you're not doing this. Because you're setting up the dog, the pups, and the breeder up for failure. Because that dog may decide to lash out at one of the pups because she's in terrible pain, right? So I'm not sure what to tell you, except maybe either talk to your vet and say, hey, going forward, I like to get this and see what they say, or get yourself a second and third vet, right? That That's my best recommendation. Is it true that you should only breed your micro twice? I, I'm sorry, sweetheart. Unfortunately, that's the one <laughs> class of bullies i have never bred and i probably won't breed nothing against them it's just that i just don't 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 have them that's all let me bring in kyle what you got kyle i was gonna ask about those pain medications and the vet giving them pain medicine how do you give them pain medicine if they're supposed to be uh feeding their puppies well because there's certain pa pain medications and the amounts that you can give uh, everything you give mom is going to come out through the milk, right? Yeah. Carprofen is more of a moderate, uh, it's more for moderate pain. And typically she would take a full amount, like say, for example, a full pill, but because she is, she just had puppies and she's whelping pups. Her dose has now been halved. Now think about this for a minute. We got 10 puppies. So if all 10 are suckling, you're getting half of that pill and then you're dividing that by 10. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? If we had say uh, three pups or even a singleton, that could be a little dicey. So all it's right? not as strong as a narcotic. So it wouldn't be a, a heavy narcotic. It's more like a tramadol, like something that's not a narcotic, but it just takes the edge off and it doesn't pass through to the puppies. That's what I was wondering. That's why I was wondering if her vet maybe wasn't doing it because of that. Well, ca Carprofen is, it, it, don't get it wrong, man. It is going through to the pups, but it's such a moderate and, and the you. amount that's given is so low. It's just to take a little bit of the edge off of mom. That's all all that is. Let me let me uh, bring in Miss Sally Ann uh, real quick. Uh, Miss Sally Ann comments, and by the way, I want to let you guys know, Miss Sally Ann is, is uh, she's a vet tech and she's been working with us uh, and we look forward to, to a working relationship and she's dropping this comment and it says, it's super rude to not give an animal some form of pain meds after a major abdominal surgery. Miss Sally Ann, I couldn't agree with you anymore. Um, to not do it 
is is a gross oversight. I mean, you you a woman when she goes to the hospital and she has a C section, do you know how much pain meds she gets? I mean, she has to. It's it's major abdominal surgery. So, Miss uh, Mickey Lucero, I strongly recommend that you find yourself a second vet, speak with your current vet, speak with that other new vet, and kind of figure out where you want to go from there. Uh, Big Prior says, I definitely have to watch this again. I missed some of the info. I think you were answering a question I wanted to ask as I came back in the live. Go ahead and ask it, Big Prior. Uh, we got Caleb Weddle says, hey, Raul, how are you doing, brother? Hey, man, none below, Caleb. Thank you so much for joining us today, man. Uh, Miss Sally Ann says, you adjust dosing and are limited in your choices for nursing mothers. But come on, man. I agree. I agree. You're not going to give her, right? We're, we're, we're not going to give her a sedative. We're not going to give her something that's just going to knock her out. We're, we're giving her carprofen, which, Miss Sally, go ahead and answer this for me if you can. What would you say carprofen is, is equivalent to to human terms would it be something like an aspirin maybe a tylenol it probably i I don't see it as anything more than that now i'm not saying carprofen is tylenol and i'm not saying give tylenol to your dogs you never do that all i'm saying is in comparison of the strength from what carprofen does for dogs to humans i would say somewhere around an aspirin or maybe uh tylenol and i don't mean like extra strength or anything like that that's just what i think um real quick guys um let me uh let me bring this in i want to show you guys this here real quick Dawn. promise bitch i'm a dog bitch i'm a dog and i'm a bully and i'm a bully bitches they love me bitches they love me they do something to me they do something to me bitch i'm a dog bitch i'm a dog and i'm a bully and i'm a bully and bitches they love me do something to me, yeah. do something to me. Bitch, I'm a dog, like said he would be. Yeah. Bitch, I'm a dog, you see in the streets. Uh. Bitch, I'm a dog, you see how I is. Uh. See how I'm smiling, you showing my teeth. Uh. Shit on my neck, shit ain't cheap. Uh. So when I read, box and repeat. Yeah. Bitch, I see, take uh. a seat. And yeah. roll this weed, shit yeah. ain't speak. Uh. Bitch, I'm a dog, bitch, I'm a dog. And I'm a bully, please yeah. do not push me. I know rev- All right, guys, I apologize. The bad words in the music is supposed to have a different song in there. Uh, my apologies all the way through. Uh, okay, Miss Sally Ann says that the equivalent of carprofen is ibuprofen. Okay, so muscle relaxant, right? Nothing, nothing major. It's it's, it's not going to be anything major like that. Um, and she's saying that it's a is an NSAID, which by the way, NSAID stands for uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, and but by all means, guys, do not give any other NSAID to dogs because human NSAIDs, they just don't have the liver to tolerate it, okay? Uh, Michael Higginson saying, what's up, Miss Sally, number love. Uh, Sulema Santiago, C-section is mandatory for XL or just in case of emergency. Sulema, look, if the male is not considerably bigger than the female, so let's use a 100-pound female. If you show up with a 160 pound male, more likely than not, you're going to need a C-section. But if you have a 100 pound female and say a 110 pound male, more likely than not, you're not going to need a C-section. Now, as a breeder, um, you don't want to lose any pups, right? Also, as a breeder, I have found, and please guys share your comments, I have found that the female goes through so much less when she has a C-section then when she goes through regular birth uh not not to mention that you may lose a pup or two i'm just saying uh let's see here uh don't second guess says uh, why is some bully head smaller uh how to breed away second guess you're gonna have to watch some more of our videos i don't want to go off topic uh small head is a dominant trait so yeah it's gonna be hard Big Prior says, I was going to ask about the koi. Uh, what would you consider too high of a koi for inbreeding and line breeding? So the line that I look at is 27 koi. If I have a female that's at 27 koi, I'm not inbreeding her. I'm not. I feel that it's that's too much. You're setting yourself up to hit 40 koi if you inbreed her. And I feel 40 koi is, I mean, just look at it. 40 is less than one percentile 
of what our diverse breed has. I feel that that no, 27. Now, um, if I had say a female that was 27 and a male that was 18 or 20, say it's her grandpa, I wouldn't have an issue with that. Um, but I'm definitely keeping my eye on that. For me, 27 is that line of high koi versus lower koi. That's just me. All right. Instarata says calcium can prevent behavior issues during and after delivery too, like a syringe of oral cal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you got to keep in mind, you also want to give that if you're doing natural birth, usually uh, one hour into it, I'll go ahead and give some sort of calcium supplement. And that's just because, um, and it happens with humans too. Uh, if the dog doesn't have enough calcium, what it could, what can happen is calcium is used for contraction of the uterus guys. So the dog could actually lose the sensation of push because she doesn't have enough calcium. Right. And, and that's called preeclampsia, right? Eclampsia is full blown. She's losing the ability to, to put, to contract her uterus because she doesn't have, uh, the calcium needed to be able to do it. So just in case one hour into it, give a calcium supplement such as NutriCal, you should be fine. Uh, don't second guess says why some bullies head smaller. I already answered you. Uh, Daniel, old person tapped in from Montana. I'm late, but I'm here. Hey, number love. Big prior says right on. Guys, listen up, man. Real quick before we go. I want to say this. Uh, tomorrow, right? 25th at 6 p.m. I am going to give the raffle results. We're also going to do everything. Uh, we have a new vet raffle. So if you bought new vet, right? New vet and new joint plus, and you did the auto ship, I will randomly pick a person that bought that that way this year, and you will be the winner. And I will supply you with new vet and new joint for one dog for an entire year. In addition, if you have not downloaded QBN app, I suggest you do within it. You can actually watch videos and answer questions right now we got 19 questions i believe no 20 questions 20 questions i'm about to drop one more um and you write those down you put them on a on a program like word or whatever copy it tomorrow at 6 p.m i'm gonna come on live i'm gonna open a window of time when you could drop your answers and you could just drop your answers in our community tab where i'm gonna ask the question those first uh, we, we, we have, we have prizes for the first winner and everybody else. So if you're, if you're in first place, you're going to get a free study, any stud on my yard, you're going to get one year supply of new vet and new joint plus, plus $250. If you're second, third, fourth, or fifth, you're getting one year supply of new vet and new joint plus $250. All right. So that's what's going on. If you haven't downloaded uh, QBN app, I suggest you do so. Let me bring my guys from the back. And uh, Steve-O, lead the way, man. You're mute. You're muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes sir. Good. <laughs> Do you guys remember the Verizon commercials? Well, you already know, fam. The platform where you come to raise your game and stay in your lane. Catching you on the next one. Hollywood. It's your boy, Hollywood Holland, your boy in the back of the queue, and we're catching you on the next one. Guys, you already know, my name is Raul from QB and Kettles. I want to thank you for joining us on Christmas Eve. I want to tell everybody Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And definitely, I want to leave you guys with this.